Next on BYUSN, will BYU football and men's basketball both be picked to finish dead last in the Big 12 next season? And what is the ideal scenario for BYU hoops as they get set for the WCC tournament in Las Vegas? Give me all of the ideal possible. Welcome to BYU Sports Nation, presented by the BYU Store, official outfitter of BYU fans everywhere. It is Tuesday, February 21st. I am Spencer Linton, teamed up alongside the very clutch and pinch-hitting <laughs> voice of the Cougars, Greg Rubel. Welcome. There's a first time for everything. We've never done the show together. And so now that's uh, a bucket list item. Let's make it Let's happen. Go. Hey, I, I can't think of a better person. Uh, in fact, you know what? Because you're a hockey guy, I want to bring up something that I saw happen not too long ago. But a goaltender at the age of 42 years young stepped in for one of the NHL teams and did a fantastic job. And uh, I don't know when it was, but it popped up on my timeline. And I thought, that is remarkable. You get these emergency goalie situations yes. in the NHL yes. that are pretty cool. It's I usually that, a guy that has a regular job, and they call him in. He's a guy that's played some minor league hockey, and he's, <laughs> and he's the third guy sitting, you know, he's like sitting in the stands, and then he becomes elevated, and he gets in games. It's pretty cool. Not to say that you are an emergency fill-in, because you're not. You're a very valued member. And of I'm way older than 42. You, <laughs> you, you know? could have fooled me. I'm, that's where I was going with this. Also, at the ripe age of 42, here you are. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, it's a pleasure to be here. You bet. Uh, I mean, just the, the Calgary Flames fan as well, and they're playing well. So You know, it's, it's a thing. So, uh, you know, BYU men's basketball, we'll talk about hoops a little bit. Mm -hmm. they, they've been, like, in every game. They're right there, right? And, it's, and, and sometimes they just break your heart. They get close, they come back, just can't quite finish it off. The hockey team I cheer for, the Calgary Flames, they lead the NHL in one-goal games, oh, okay. in one-goal losses, in overtime losses. They're just right there all season long. So I've, I've had a lot of that this year. <laughs> Are you doing all right? I'm doing okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're going we're to try and make everybody feel better today with a great show lineup as well. Coming up on today's show, ESPN's Bill Connolly will join the program to break down his SP Plus rankings for the 2023 college football season. BYU track and fields, Elena Ellsworth and Annalise Hart joining us in studio fresh off their record-breaking DMR performance over the weekend in Arkansas. Great stories there. And we'll share the top five most unbreakable BYU records for this week's Top 5 Love Tuesday. that conversation. All right, let's get to today's headlines, beginning with Lauren Gustin, who is named the Co-West Coast Conference Player of the Week. This marks her third WCC Player of the Week honor this season. On Saturday, she set the single-season West Coast Conference record for total rebounds. That mark currently at 440. Good grief. Gustin and the Cougars will take on the Portland Pilots. Huge matchup between the second place Pilots and fourth place Cougars Thursday, 9 Eastern, 7 Mountain. Stream it live on BYU TV or the BYU TV app. BYU men's volleyball, despite taking it on the chin on the weekend against UCLA, hanging steady at number eight in the latest AVCA poll. Cougars will be on the road for a matchup against Concordia this Saturday. BYU baseball drops game four of their season opening series against Louisiana Tech. 10 to two, the Cougars now two and two this season. BYU will head south of Ruston, Louisiana to take on the Louisiana University Ragin' Cajuns for another four game series in the state of Louisiana from Wednesday through Saturday. Baseball heading down to Lafayette. Uh, the softball team sweeping player and pitcher of the week honors in the WCC. Martha Epinesa, the WCC player of the week, second WCC honor for her career. And the freshman case in court earning WCC pitcher of the week. This after BYU secured wins in the Littlewood Classic. Cooks head to California for the Mary Nutter Classic starting with a doubleheader on Thursday against Missouri and Texas A&M. All rise and shout. It's time for What's Trending. What's Trending presented by BYU Food To Go, the MVP of your next event. This topic based on a couple of metrics that uh, don't exactly favor BYU very well, but it's brought up a big question, Greg, and, and that is based on BYU men's basketball uh, being last in net and in the Ken Palmer ratings of all 14 Big 12 teams going into next season. These are current numbers. Let's note. BYU is still a top 100 team in both. Yes. But the Big 12 is so good, and the incoming teams are so good, that even as a top 100 team, you're still at the very bottom of the list. Wild. 
And we're going to have Bill Connolly, ESPN uh, College Football Insider, on the show today. He released his SP Plus projections, BYU number 62 in that latest rundown. Mm -hmm. That's also last of all 14 Big 12 teams going into next college football season. Proving again depth of league. They're moving into a really strong situation. Yes, and 62... In the grand scheme of college football, not terrible Middle when there of the are pack. over 130 college Middle football pack, teams right. at Division I FBS level. So, with those numbers in mind, do we expect BYU to be picked to finish last in the Big 12 next year in both football and men's basketball? You know, I, I, I think that there might be a deep enough dive made by all those who do, these, do the rankings to find a way to put BYU somewhere other than 14th next year in football. Um, you bring in a, a, a quarterback with a lot of P5 reps. Uh, you bring back, you, you bring in good running backs and Aiden Robbins and, and LJ Martin. Yeah. You bring back wide receivers and Cody Epps and Keanu Hill and Chase Roberts. Offensive line does have some spaces to fill and some, and some shoes to fill. There's sure. no doubt. There has to be some things done there. But uh, Jay Hill revamps a BYU defense, and I, I think there will be enough reasons to, 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 to determine that BYU may not be that 14th team. In, in fact, I, I, I kind of expect BYU to be mm. contending for middle of the pack in the Big 12 immediately in, in football. So I think it's less likely that football ends up there than, than basketball because of the depth of the basketball talent right now. Um, I, I, I think BYU makes a, a quicker rise perhaps in football. But basketball, if you take the, you know, the current numbers, there's a bit of a gap there between you know, the bottom, uh, let's say 13th and 14th, with BYU backing up 14. And who knows, Mark Pope in the offseason could, um, could, could bring in the kind of talent that, uh, that moves BYU up the chart more than we think right now. But, yeah, I think as of right now, you're probably looking at BYU uh, as kind of a lower-tier team in basketball, if not 14th right now. Now, I know SP+, Plus, as far as it pertains to football, is only one metric. And BYU started last season... Last February, they were number 23, yeah. coming off of a 10-3 and three season. They had a ton of returning pr production. They were number one in the entire country in terms of returning production on offense. It didn't pan out because of injuries and, I mean, ad nauseum, all of the reasons that we have laid out why BYU only won eight games. Still, eight and five, were four and five at one point, made a nice push. BYU finishes 70th. So they started 23rd, finished 70th. They mm -hmm. dropped 47 spots. Bill Connolly actually has them up eight spots from where they finished to number 62. And also, for what it's worth, BYU ranked in the current SP Plus numbers last in offense and defense of all of the competing Big 12 teams. That said, I do not expect BYU football to be picked to finish last. I'm yeah. probably anticipating somewhere between 10 and 12. Maybe higher. I don't know. I, I, again, I don't, it depends on how deep of a dive you take and how much yeah. stock you put into Keaton Slovis coming over right. and what he's capable of right. uh, based on what he did at USC and Pittsburgh. Like it's, we're, we're all projecting, but I would imagine somewhere between 10 and 12. The basketball side, however, I would not be shocked to see BYU pick to finish dead last because that conference yeah. is it's, just so dominant. It's a 10-team league right now, right? And they're not really close to team number 10. You bring in uh, Houston, who's the number one team in the country. And then Cincinnati, and of course, Cincinnati and UCF would, would appear to be, you know, the next best competition for BYU to avoid that seller spot right now. And, and I think it ultimately will come down to, you know, which of those three teams is judged one, two, three among the newcomers. Houston will be up uh, higher. And, of course, the remaining 10, there's no reason to drop them, you know, considerably lower than where they're going to be this year. So I think you have the three newcomers kind of battling to see who's going to be that, that 12, 13, 14 sp uh, spot in, uh, in year one. It's not always terrible to have low expectations. Like, or, I, I, or, or even low, or even just low projections, because yeah, the expectations okay will be higher. The, I mean, be, let's, but the outside expectations might be low. The internal expectations will be higher. Um, and I always go back to to when I began this gig uh, at basketball play by play. Uh, my first year was 1996-97, splitting duties with Paul James at the time, and that was BYU's one in 25 year. Oh man. So really came in on the ground floor uh, on that one. Okay. So <laughs> Victory over Utah yeah. State, though. Been at the bottom. And then the next year, uh, first year of the Steve Cleveland era, yeah. BYU was uh, it was a nine-win season, trying to build their way up. Uh, and, and so they've, they've been at the bottom before. And, and there was really something exhilarating about the climb. You know? and, and back in the day, the climb was incremental. The first one was, can you qualify for your conference tournament? Because back in the day, not every, not every team made the conference tournament in Whack Mountain West. And, and so can you, can you make your tournament? You know? Then can you win a game in your tournament? 
then can you win two games in your tournament? Then can you play for your tournament championship? Can you win your tournament championship? Then in the overall league, can you, you know, how high can you get? And then you get regular season titles. And so it was this incremental, can, when do you get back to the NIT? When do you get back to the NCAAs? It was step by step. And I was with them every step of the way, every year, kind of checking off a new box. And there was something really rewarding and exhilarating about the climb. And that's where BYU is going to be. And basketball in particular is climbing. You know, um, and it'll be about, you know, can you win a game in Kansas City in your conference tournament? Can you play in the postseason, in the NIT? When do you get to the middle of the pack and find yourself on the bubble or playing in the NCAA tournament? Yeah. Whether or not you contend for a championship, and that's the toughest league to win, right? It may not necessarily be about contending for a championship. Can you get to the middle of the pack in the heart of that league to where you're NCAA tournament worthy. But I think year over year, bit by bit, it's going to be those check in the boxes. Tournament wins in Kansas City, NIT appearance, NCAA appearance. Yeah. It, it is very, um, it's rewarding. Yeah, you the know? build was fun. And the, the time period that you're referencing, 96 to 01, was a wild ride, but it, a, lo a lot of fun. It was a grind. It was a five, six year grind to where, yeah, in 2001, they're back in the NCAA tournament, where, where, where it really matters, right? And they won the Mountain West Conference Tournament Championship. The last one BYU's won, by the way. It's oh, been man. 22 years, which we'll get to in Vegas here in a bit. But it's a really cool thing. And again, the Big 12 is so good, so good, that you may not be aspiring for that Kansas level. But you can be a middle-of-the-pack team in the Big 12 and be one of the best teams in the country. Of course, you'll aspire for higher, but... The standards might change a little bit. Yeah, certainly. Maybe checking the box in year one for BYU is not finishing last in the Big 12. I'm dead serious. Really? Like that, yeah. that, that could be the box that you check, and yeah. you just go from there. And, right? if you end, and if you end up one of those early games in Kansas City, can you get to day two? Yeah. You know, and you go step by step. Fantastic. And, and it could be the rise is a lot quicker than we're presuming. It could be that there, you know, things surprise you all the time in the world of sports. Maybe it happens faster than expected, but you are running into the, the gauntlet of all gauntlets in college basketball. BYU trying to close out their West Coast Conference finale here before they move to the Big 12 with something positive. And right now, it's downright tough. I mean, you've lost four games in a row. You're going to finish with a losing record in WCC play. Best you can do there is 7-9. and nine. And the best, I think, based on tiebreakers, which are convoluted in the WCC, is finish – in fifth, as of today, fifth to eighth is the window. It just yeah. depends on how things shake out. So, Greg, my question for you is, why does this week matter so much for BYU men's basketball when uh, maybe a good deal of the fan base is kind of like, ah, let's just get on to the Big 12? Why well, does think, it matter? I think there's a belief that, that BYU will go to Vegas thinking it can beat every team it will face, um, just as every team could beat BYU. The Cougs have lost to Pepperdine this year. But you want to give yourself maybe as few games as possible to have to play to get to that point. So if you can avoid the Thursday game at all costs, that's what you got to do. For that to happen, a couple things have to happen. Okay. Um, now, if, if the favorites win on Thursday, this is a four-game Thursday, BYU's not playing, LMU's not playing. Right. If just the favorites win, that would mean St. Mary's beats Pacific. That would mean Santa Clara beats Pepperdine. That would mean Gonzaga beats San Diego and USF beats Portland. And USF's at home and St. Mary's is at home, Santa Clara's at home, Gonzaga's at home. So they're all the favored teams and they're home. If they all win, it sets up to be pretty simple. If BYU wins on Saturday against San Francisco, they avoid the seventh seed, they avoid Thursday, and they get into the Friday play as five or six. If BYU loses to San Francisco on Saturday, they would need Portland to win at Pacific on the final day to avoid the bottom uh, four and a, and a first round game on wow. Thursday. BYU is going to win tie breaks against Pacific and San Francisco and Portland okay. at this point. Uh, unless they were to lose to San Francisco, of course, which would be a sweep that would be head to head for San Francisco. Um, so, yeah, it, they, they shouldn't play on Saturday. Rather, they shouldn't play on Thursday in Vegas as long as they can take care of a business this Saturday. Just beat San Francisco on Saturday. Pretty much. Okay, first and foremost. And some weird things can happen on Thursday yes. which change things. But if the favorites hold, that's what you're looking at. So I've been saying for a few weeks now, if BYU can just somehow work their way into the number five seed. And, and I know, like, things, the chips have to fall in a very, very favorable way, including beating San Francisco. But if they could be that five seed... I like the matchup with LMU as the four seed yep. that is potentially pending on Saturday. Of course, then you're probably taking on Portland or San Diego on Friday. Right, and you're not playing Pepperdine. And you're not playing Pepperdine. Okay, so, so, I, I think if you, if, you, if you fall to the six or the seven, certainly if you fall to the seven, there's a good chance you're seeing Pepperdine on night one. 
And Pepperdine already knows they can beat BYU. Yeah. That happened, right? And, 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 they're, and they're a better team than their record. That, that's a cliche, but they really shouldn't be where they are with as, as much talent as they have. And even the six, you're in that, you're in that six, seven hole, same thing. If you can get to the five, um, you, you avoid a, a Pepperdine game, which I think Pepperdine could get out of round one. I think they could beat the seven in round one. Yeah. Whoever the, I, whoever I mean, the seven is. Good grief. I'd almost rather that BYU finish eighth than seventh so that you can have a matchup with. I don't, I don't want to go that low. <laughs> 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 I just, it's about matchups. Let's hope for five. It's Let's, about matchups in possible. March. Right, right. And I like, I, we're talking ideal scenario. Right. BYU could just climb to number five and then take on San Diego, Portland, like both those matchups. And then I think they match up okay with LMU. And then you're through the weekend and you're into Monday and let's see what happens. And wouldn't it be something? Because as much of a grind as it has been for BYU in the conference tournament, you know, in the year where they're maybe dipping a little more than you'd expect, maybe this is the year that that magical run happens and they find themselves in a place they haven't been in a while. Again, it's been 22 years oh. since BYU won a conference tournament championship. That's crazy to think about. Yeah, uh, and because it would make no sense, it probably would make perfect sense. <laughs> in this of all years, that just yeah. That seems, seems to how sports work sometimes. All right, our question of the day. As BYU finishes out the West Coast Conference and pushes to the Big 12, of course – all sports involved in that conversation outside of men's volleyball. What type of realistic success do you expect from BYU athletics in year one of Big 12 play? This opens it up to every sport, realistic success. Thomas Gordon on Twitter answers, I expect a few sports to be near the top. Women's volleyball, soccer come to mind, while the rest I expect to at least be competitive, football among others, and I expect a few to struggle, namely men's basketball. That's summed up pretty nicely. Yeah, I, I would concur with uh, with Thomas's sentiments there. Um, and I think, too, if you want to bring into it the Learfield Directors' Cup standings, I, perhaps BYU could aspire to be a top-tier team in the Directors' Cup because if you were to look at uh, the 14 programs that will make up the Big 12 next year, after the fall standings of 2022, BYU was one, number one of 14 programs in the Big 12 in terms of Learfield Directors' Cup overall yeah. sports supremacy. Now you're going to bring into the winter and spring sports that rankings will change a little bit, but it's a pretty good spot to be first of 14 teams in this 14-team grouping. Uh, and so I, I think BYU could aspire to be, even in year one, a top-tier Learfield Directors' Cup team, which encompasses all those different sports. And, and I think another secondary fun question is, which BYU team becomes the first to win a Big 12 championship? And women's soccer is going to have a pretty good shot yes. to be that first team. I feel like it's cross-country and or women's soccer. Yeah, the track right and field there. cross-country teams are going to be in the mix with some of the best in the country that find themselves in the Big 12. They'll be fun to watch. We'll be talking track and field later, but those teams are going to jump right into the Big 12 and be in the mix. I love that. Hashtag BYUSN Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram to join that conversation. What type of realistic success do you expect from BYU Athletics in year one of Big 12 play? All right, up next, Greg, what's on docket? Well, we've got to talk about the fact that uh, we've got only two more of these BYU Basketball with Mark Pope shows tonight and next Tuesday. So tonight, we'll look forward to senior night, wrap up the regular season. Next Tuesday, we'll take a look at the WCC tournament. And tonight, we have the real stars of the show. The grad assistants mm. are on the program with Coach Pope and me. And that's at 830 Eastern, 630 Mountain on the BYU TV app. In the words of Mark Pope, let's go, baby. Coming up next, ESPN's Bill Connolly joins us to discuss his SP Plus rankings and how he thinks BYU is going to fare in year one of Big 12 play. This is BYU Sports Nation. This portion of BYU Sports Nation is presented by BYU Food to Go, the MVP of your next event. We are live in Studio B with your day-to-day -day BYU sports play-by-play. -play. I'm Spencer Linton alongside the voice of the Cougars, Greg Rebell, who is sitting in for Jerem Jordan today. And joining us now is ESPN College Football Insider and the creator of the SP Plus Projections, Bill Connolly. Bill, welcome back to BYU Sports Nation. Great to have you on the program. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. All right, let's start with this. Uh, last season, BYU was essentially number one in returning <laughs> – production and number 23 overall in your SP plus 
Expectations were super high. Injuries set in. BYU sustained a four-game losing streak in the middle of the season. They wind up number 70, 47 spots below where they were projected. <laughs> what happened to BYU football by the numbers? Yeah, I mean, by the numbers, offense got a little worse, which, you know, the the differences in the receiving core and what you thought you were going to have heading into the year and then, you know, with the injuries and whatnot. Obviously, I think that played a major role. Uh, the run game seemed fine, so I do think it was mostly the passing game um, and, and just a need for a few bigger plays here and there. But obviously, the biggest shift was on the defense. Defense was extremely experienced. It had regressed in 2021. Um, any sort of major boost in the projections were coming from uh, that side of the ball and, lo and looking to get back to kind of a top 20 or 30 or at least top 40 or 50 level. Uh, they were 95th and uh, bottom just fell out on that side of the ball. And, uh, you know, you're just not going to. It was bent, don't break the bent way too much to have any benefit whatsoever and uh, just didn't come together. So, I mean, I like I like the hires. Uh, there, there's a potential for uh, a decent rebound if, if just getting some new blood in charge of everything works well. But, yeah, heading into this coming year, projected kind of borderline top uh, 40 offense, which I could definitely see, and a borderline top 80 defense. That's where the improvement is uh, most required. Yeah, fair, fair to say, Bill, that, that the numbers or the rankings have to draw closer to one another. Too big of a gap right now between the O and the D. Right. Yeah, I mean, that's certainly – I mean, if, if you know, the gap is that the offense is number one and the defense is 40th, that's a, still a pretty big that's gap. That's doable, not, yeah. Not nearly as much of a problem. But, yeah, I mean, the bottom line is for the the offense could absolutely stand to improve, but the defense has to catch back up pretty pretty drastically. Where's the correlation for you in returning production to success at the end of the season? Yeah, it's more – the the correlation is typically to improvement and regression more than quality or lack thereof. Like if you had the worst, if you were the worst team in FBS last year and you return everybody, you're not suddenly supposed to be one of the best, but you're supposed to improve because continuity experience, those things matter, obviously. So that's the correlations got screwed up by the fact that BYU didn't really live up to that last year. They had a very, very high percentage of returning production and fell 30 spots. And um that's not how that's supposed to work this year. The the numbers are pretty are, are OK, obviously leaning pretty heavily on transfers this time around. And that's those pr the production of those transfers does get factored into the equation. Like Keaton Slovitz, obviously his his numbers count. So that helps. But yeah, it's it's the <laughs> the correlation was all screwed up by BYU last year. We'll see what that means for this year. That's great news, Bill. It's great news. <laughs> you, broke, you broke the math. You broke the math last year. Now, speaking of Keaton Slovis and Aiden Robbins, running back coming over from UNLV, the transfer portal, I'm sure, is quite the uh, trek for you each year when yeah. you're trying to piece this together. It's wild. It's free agency in college sports. So how do you manage that and, and try and come up with a number system that you feel confident in because there are so many moving parts and late in the game? Yeah. Um, yeah. So in previous years, like long ago, when I first started doing this, it was it was enough to basically just take the, you know, the three or four transfers that you maybe bring in at most um, kind of plug their production from previous schools into the into the current production and, and just leave it at that. That's you know, it's factored into returning production. The recruiting piece is still based on normal, plain old recruiting classes as normal. And that worked pretty well. Starting last year, especially, though, obviously, things exploded so quickly that I was kind of taking on a few guesses here and there as to how to incorporate this, you know, suddenly it wasn't three or four transfers. It was 18 and it was including the reigning Bolitnikov winner or the soon to be Heisman winner and five star guys. And that's, that was new. And uh, now that there's a year of data, I have a better way of approaching it. It's, it's not enough to put it into the return and production piece. It's now factored into recruiting as well. Um, I think I have a pretty good plan based on what we saw last year and we'll find out. It really is the recruiting piece now is a mix of the recruiting rankings and and transfer quality and just transfer pure transfer volume uh factors into it as well. And obviously, you know, BYU's got decent volume this year. Well, Bill, now's the year that uh, you and everyone else start uh putting BYU in the uh the P5 bin when it comes to data sorting. Uh and and in 2023, the schedule features an FCS a brand new FCS or a brand new FBS that was FCS last year, and then a road game in the SEC before the Big 12 slate uh, comes on the plate. Uh, thoughts on a win-loss window for BYU in 2023? 
Well, from an SP plus perspective, the average win total that I'm looking at right now is around five. Big variation in in potential here, though, because uh, not a lot of sure losses. You got the, the extremely likely wins at the start. Not a ton of sure losses. Just a lot of games where BYU is a slight underdog, basically like four points against Kansas, three and a half against Cincinnati, uh, two against Iowa State. Just a lot of like that. So basically. If BYU can uh, exceed projections a little bit, and they're projected 62nd, that's really not that bad. Uh, but you're joining a no bad teams conference, right. basically. Um, and that's going to, it's just going to be close game after close game. And if they can exceed projections by a little bit, especially on the defensive side, then there are a lot of wins uh, on the table. It's just there are a lot of losses, too. It's, it's, this is this is life in the Big 12. Whoever wins the close games, you know, win, makes the conference title game, and, and somebody's going to lose those close games as well. Bill Connolly of ESPN is on BYU Sports Nation. From your perspective, outside of the Pro Bowl bubble and outside of the BYU bubble, <laughs> would making a bowl game qualify as a successful season for BYU? I, I think after what we saw last year, yes. Um, Ask me this a year ago, and I'm thinking, you know, I, I'm probably not saying BYU is a, a Big 12 contender necessarily, but I'm thinking seven, eight, nine wins is certainly on the table. But now there's a lot of there's a reset coming on here on the uh, on defense, especially. And, you know, that kind of knocked them behind, however it came about. And, you know, whether the fixes work or not, we'll see. But uh, it did knock BYU kind of off that that trajectory that we saw the last couple of years. And they got to get back on it. So at this stage, yeah, if you can beat Sam Houston in Southern Utah, win the, the closest projected games, what Kansas, Cincinnati, Texas Tech, uh, Iowa State get to six and six. Obviously, even six and six is probably going to include some close games that you thought you should have won. But yeah, you get to six wins and just call it a win uh, this first season. Bill, I, I, I've admired your work for a, a long, long time. Uh, so much so that that this book <laughs> is is on my shelf in my yes. office. And this has probably come up on what, nine or ten years that this that this book uh, came out. Yeah, twenty thirteen. So yeah, ten years. Yeah. And, and I still refer to it frequently, and, and, and there's a lot of highlighted passages I have in this. And, and one of them I love, and, and these are your words, which kind of, they really speak to me, if I don't mind. Uh, stats can teach us what is truly important about a given sport. Tell us where to focus our eyes and give us a path for better understanding and enjoying a sport we most likely already loved. That's a really great summation of why numbers guys become numbers guys. And yes, I know there are tons of cliches about there about, you know, lies, darn lies and statistics and how stats are for losers, et cetera. But uh, the way you put it out there uh, makes it make sense for a lot of people like me and others. And I think you do amazing work. I'm so grateful for you and what you've uh, done in the world of analytics to help people like me and others understand the game better. And uh, just kudos to you. I, I appreciate it. I do think um, a lot of it is basically getting people to accept that they already use stats. Uh, there are just better stats to use. You know, we all, you know, the people who say stats are for losers or turn around and reference somebody's, you know, passing yards per game or something. And, you know, it's just, there's better, we can do better. And and I think over the last 10 years, since I wrote that book, we are doing a decent amount better, even if, uh, you know, people yelling on Twitter about fourth downs proves that we've still got a little ways to go here. <laughs> All right, Bill, I'm going to ask you to put on some BYU blue goggles for a moment and just, <laughs> okay. just say, OK. And I ask this question because because you are a numbers guy. Where do you feel like BYU is most likely to exceed expectations by the numbers? Um, I do think the off. I was going to say offense, but um, hmm. <laughs> well, yeah, no, I'll I'll stick with that. I can see something coming together. I like Aiden Robbins a good amount. Um, obviously, so much new on the defense. I like Jay Hill, but we'll see what he can do and how quickly. If if BYU really does exceed projections this year, I'm going to say um, that run game really clicked. The offensive line clearly has a lot of experience uh, that might come in you know, pretty handy. Um, and, and, you know, the guys who got hurt or the guys who stepped up last year while injuries were hitting the receiving core, um, I can see – the experience through that process paying off this year. So I can see, um, you know, the projected 42nd, I could see a top 30 offense coming Ooh. out of that. And like I said, if you can, if you can exceed projections just a little bit, that could pay off with a number of, uh, that could tip a number of close games overall. Bill, BYU's finally P5 officially with the Big 12 membership. What have you been thinking about BYU in the 
preceding years because they've been playing a much heavier P5 centric schedule, even though they were an independent. Were you kind of already maybe kind of tilting that way in terms of how you perceive them or project them? Oh, yeah. I mean, that's, you know, they were top 50 in SP plus most years. I'm looking at, you know, starting in 2011, it was, you know, 42, 39, a bunch of 30s, a bunch of 40s. Obviously, 2017, when the offense fell apart, like that was there was a reset going on there, but they were right back in the top 50. Top 50 is P5. Um, we act like, you know, there are 60 something P5 bids. We act like that means, you know, top the, the all top 60 is 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 p5 that's obviously not the case but if you're a top 40 or 50 program you're you're not only p5 you're at worst kind of an average p5 team uh, and byu's been that so yeah i mean how to uh, you know categorize byu over the last decade has been really weird overall and i'm happy it's a lot easier now <laughs> but on paper they've been a at least mid-tier p5 team for most of the last uh for most of the last decade Bill, once again, you have proven that just because you put the Cougars at number 62, you don't hate the program. <laughs> this is That's not right. personal. It's just numbers. Hey, we appreciate yes. the time as always. Uh, stay warm for the remaining weeks, and um, <laughs> we'll look forward to seeing you when college football season rolls around. Thank Sounds you, Bill. Good. Bill Connolly of ESPN. SP Plus projections, always a fun metric and a meaningful one. I mean, there are a lot of metrics out there, Greg, but I, I personally put a lot of stock into what he does I feel like he gives us a good idea of what we can anticipate going into a college football season. Love the way he breaks it down. He's he's uh, the um, the author, if you will, of the five factors, and his five factors are great. And however, whichever 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 stats inside these you want to pick and choose, it comes to explosiveness, efficiency, field position, finishing drives, and turnovers. Though in in those five factors, you can pretty much find the success or failure of any football team. I love the way he breaks it down. Good stuff. Fantastic. Well, don't miss out on BYU baseball tomorrow. Tune in to the BYU baseball team on BYU Radio. Jason Shepard on the call as the Cougs take on the Raging Cajuns of Louisiana down in Lafayette. Shep on the call with coverage starting tomorrow at 7 p.m. Eastern time. Up next, we discuss what might be one of the biggest reasons for BYU men's basketball and their recent struggles, particularly in the West Coast Conference. What's the metric? Stay with us. This is BYU Sports Nation. BYU Sports Nation is presented by the BYU Store, official outfitter of BYU fans everywhere. This is BYU Sports Nation. To interact with the show and get great content throughout the day, Follow us on our social media platforms on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok. I need more Greg Rebell on TikTok. There's no Greg Rebell on TikTok <laughs> as of this point. He is the TikTok less Greg Rebell. I am Spencer Linton. I tweet. I'm a one trick pony. Yeah, it's yeah a little bit of Instagram. I, yeah. I don't have much TikTok either. It's okay. <laughs> and it's okay. Let's whip it. Cougar Whip Round presented by Maersk, your e-commerce logistics shipping partner. Start us off, Greg. All right, Santa Clara's Brandon Pajemski wins WCC Player of the Week, and St. Mary's Aiden Mahaney won WCC Freshman of the Week for this okay. past week. And unfortunately, the Cougars were, as they say, witnesses. Uh, <laughs> both guys, Pajemski and Mahaney, had great games against BYU. I'm so glad that BYU could help out in that regard, Greg. It's just wonderful. Which brings up an even bigger question based on what you just presented. With BYU yet to win a West Coast Conference Player of the Week award in men's basketball at any point this season, how does this relate to BYU's struggles this season? Well, there's not no correlation. Um, 11 of the 15 WCC Player of the Week awards this year have gone to the teams in the top four. Okay, so the best teams are the teams with the best players yeah. having the best weeks. So th there's not no correlation. Uh, BYU and San Francisco, interestingly. BYU and USF, the two teams picked to finish third behind. Gonzaga and St. Mary's, they're the only two teams without a WCC Player of the Week this year. Well. And they are now lower than they were expected to be. So again, this isn't the be all and end all. I mean, there are a lot of great players. You can only award one in any given week. But the fact that BYU has been dry in this award is kind of emblematic of where BYU sits in the league this year. You need more standouts from your best players to have great weeks. And great weeks mean multiple wins per weekend. And BYU's had some winless weekends and a split decision week. So it's just kind of all part of the package right yeah. now. But it is interesting. The two teams picked to finish third haven't had one yet. And they're the two teams that have dropped the most from where their preseason projections were. So it matters a bit. It's not the whole thing, but I tweeted this out yesterday. 
first five, six, seven, eight years of WCC membership, BYU had multiple, two, three, and four yep. every year because the players were that good and the results were that good. Last three years, BYU's had only two players of the week over three seasons. So the standout performances have diminished. And the maybe the biggest and most important point of all, Spencer and folks, is that the rest of the league has gotten more better players, the kind that win players of the week. BYU's had an alpha for a long time, at least one. I mean, for the last decade. Jimmer, Brandon Davies, Tyler Haas, Matt Carlino, Kyle Collinsworth, Alex Barcelo. There's always been at least one. TJ Haas in the mix. If not multiple, Greg, there's always been at least one. BYU doesn't really have that guy this year. Ideally, you've got a big three. Really, ideally, you've got a big three. And in BYU's best seasons, you get a big three of guys who can go off on any given night and pretty much consistently every night. This year, Foose is kind of your guy. Foose is your consistent expectation guy. But he's an undersized, by height, undersized five-man yeah. as the guy that, that you're leaning on to be your anchor right now. It's tough for Foose to shoulder that entire load. All right. On to the next. Let's discuss some volleyball, shall we, Greg? Are you surprised BYU men's volleyball stayed at number eight in the AVCA coaches poll after being swept by number two UCLA over the weekend in both matches? I guess I would say no uh, for this reason. The concentration of talent, the concentration of top level elite tier volleyball teams in the men's level is rather constricted. And so BYU can still have the kind of weekend it had and be one of the very best. And, and so, no, I guess I'm not terribly surprised they hung right around that mix because uh, you have to look at the options. If not BYU, then who in that spot? And, and again, BYU's been so good for so long, yeah. and the concentration yeah. of talent is so, um, again, kind of uh, narrow and, and wound in tight in men's volleyball that BYU can expect to kind of be there uh, most of the season without a total free fall. Well, let's be honest. The people, the volleyball metrics folks are looking at what BYU did, even though they were swept twice by UCLA. BYU had leads late in those sets in the first two of the first night. So it's not like BYU was absolutely shellacked and blown out of the water by a very talented UCLA team. It was the number two team in the country. They were, they were yeah. there. They were there for a while. Uh, the second match was not as close as the first, but the point is the metrics people are looking at, okay, well, what did you do in those sets? And BYU was good enough, I feel, to remain certainly in the top ten. Yeah, number eight. All right. If you missed any of our BYU TV sports interviews, shows, games, Deep Blue, or just want to watch it all again, go to BYUSN.com or download the BYU TV app to get all the BYU TV sports content on demand. Well, that's another championship and record-breaking weekend for BYU track and field. These are becoming the norm. Stars Elena Ellsworth and Annalise Hart join us next to discuss their medley record. This is BYU Sports Nation. This portion of BYU Sports Nation is presented by Maersk, your e-commerce logistics shipping partner. Welcome back to BYU Sports Nation. We are live in Studio B and have moved over to the council room where we have <laughs> great conversations with elite BYU athletes. Speaking of, a couple of record breakers joining us now, Elena Ellsworth and Annalise Hart of BYU Women's Track and Field. Congratulations on uh, your record-setting performance and welcome to BYU Sports Nation. There are so many cool storylines to hit. This happened in Arkansas over the weekend. And, and you'd been on that track yeah. only three weeks before mm -hmm. and, and ran a 10.57 in the neighborhood. Three weeks later, you pull off a 10.49.24. How did you cut off eight to nine seconds in three weeks on the same track? And how, how much of a benefit was it for to have been there and run there already? Um, running there, is, it's an incredible track. It's super fast. Um, I think that that three weeks that we... So when the previous team we had, um, we were all really close. This team's a little bit more of like we've pulled people. So we have a freshman and we have... She came from the sprint side and Sadie has come back from all of her injuries. And so we kind of came together, and that was the first time we all ran together. And I think from there, we created this relationship. And when you have a relationship with someone and you go out there and you run a relay, it's like you, you want to do it for them. And so I think we all kind of ignited a little bit more passion, and a little bit passion not only for the sport, but also for our teammates. And we all contributed. Um, we noticed that each of us took off a little bit of time ourselves. And so it wasn't like one person. It was like a whole group combination. Mm. So. Amazing, amazing performance. And Annalise, I mean, I, I kind of get lost in the uh, sometimes because I, I'm a track and field guy. I love it. I, it's super exciting. 
But for those that are not familiar with what you just pulled off, what are the dynamics of the, the distance medley relay? Who runs what leg and which leg comes in which order? Yeah, it's a bit unique and it's something that is new to me coming like as a sprinter coming to the distance medley relay. Yeah. So it kind of starts out with the 1200 meter and that's what our freshman Taylor Rohinski ran and she did amazing. And then I'm the 400 leg and I'm second on the relay. Next is a handoff to Elena. She's the 800 meter leg. And then Sadie Sargent is our miler. And yeah, everyone just pulled out their best performances that day. And it was really cool to be able to experience that together. And I think coming back to Arkansas, we were all super familiar with the track. You know, we knew what to expect on each turn because we felt it before this season. And Elena felt it, you know, last uh, time they set the record last year, it was on that same track as well, which was kind of cool to go set that record again at the same track. So it's essentially two and a half miles, correct? Is that, yeah. is that what we're getting at? Yeah. 12, 4, 8, 16, and the men run the same distances in the DMR too, yeah. right? Yeah. And by the way, speaking of which, they also set a school record yeah. on the road at Notre Dame. On the, so it was a great DMR weekend for it the men was. and the women. And beyond that, it was MPSF titles yeah. for the men and the women, because you were spread all around the country. Yeah. You had men's DMR, women's DMR, men's MPSF, and women in Spokane. You're all over the place and all just winning titles. It's yeah. awesome. Mm -hmm. Uh, you were part of the previous record team in the DMR, 10.52. You took three seconds off that. Yeah. Can you compare the race you ran, uh, which would have been in 21, two years ago, right, uh, to the race that you guys ran to break it? Um, so the last time when I raced it, I ran the 400 um, in it, and then my sister ran the 800, so it was really – that was really amazing because having, like, me and my sister, we had – History. That was Lauren. Yeah, yep. Lauren. So it's like we've had history. And then also Courtney and Olivia had been friends for like years. So it's like all of us had this relationship. And so we came together. And so I never thought that, honestly, we'd have a faster team. I was mm. like, this is it. I, you know. And so the fact that we were able to all come together with all these different people with different backgrounds who are just now like creating this relationship was pretty incredible. <laughs> and honestly, a little bit like mind-blowing a super cool experience two really fast teams in front of you right are, are oregon and arkansas you come in third the fact that you came in third just ahead of oklahoma state does that mean a little something knowing that in years to come that's going to be a conference rivalry oh yeah <laughs> it was really it was really cool and the actually the second and the third like we were all like it was like within a second it was really Ooh. tight it was close yeah. very tight and so which gives us hope that hopefully at nationals we'll be able to maybe cut off a little bit more time each and, and be able to win something pretty cool. Elena Ellsworth and Annalise Hart are with us on BYU Sports Nation. Annalise, at what point did you feel like, okay, we're, we're running a really fast race? Like, are you, can, can you recognize it in the moment? And if so, when was that? Yeah, leading up to the race all last week, I think we were all we were pretty nervous. We knew what we were going to Arkansas to do. We ultimately wanted to qualify for the national championship. And so that was kind of our goal. And with that goal, you know, it was a lot of kind of pressure and a lot of expectations riding on us. And so we were pretty nervous throughout the week. But I think the day before the race and the day of the race, I think, you know, surely the nerves are there. But I've learned that nerves are a good thing and nerves help you push through barriers that are hard to break. And so I know right before the race, I turned to Elena and I said, hey, let's run with confidence. And that's exactly what we did. Like, we train so much for this moment to just run for at least me. It's, it's only 52 seconds that I get to go out there and I train for days and days and days to do that race. And so I just, I think we all went out there and just ran with confidence. And that was ultimately the goal that we had to do. So I think the 400 and the 800, and this is totally just my personal opinion, are probably the worst races <laughs> ever, the most grueling <laughs> races ever. And those are the two they legs are. that you run. That's what people tell us all the time. <laughs> <laughs> you hand off, like, what's that moment like when you're just absolutely gassed and you know that Elena is about to run another just grueling leg? Yeah, it's definitely a feeling that I've learned to love. It's, it's definitely painful, but when you have that baton in your hand, like Coach Taylor before the race was telling us, like this baton just enlarges your heart. And it really does. It has this like magic power where you like, you have the baton in your hand and I'm like, I just need to get this to Elena as fast as possible. And then once she receives that, she, she goes for it and she runs an incredible leg as well. So You're not just running for yourself. Absolutely not. <laughs> right. You guys went into the, uh, into the race ranked ninth, came out of it fifth. You're a top five team now in DMR. Feels pretty good? Yeah. It's, so good. it's all about nationals. Um, I was watching a little bit of track and field this past weekend on TV, and it was the, uh, the pro U.S. event in Albuquerque. And that's going to be your track for nationals, right? Yes. Your thoughts about going to nationals and running at altitude's got to help. Um, about what's to come, your thoughts? 
You know, last year when we were at, um, not last year, it was right when COVID hit. We mm. were there at that same track. And then we were supposed to run the day before, or the next day. It was that track. And yeah, that's where we were. And then we got sent home. Oh. And so it's sort of like, for me at least, it's like going back. And I was supposed to run the 800 on the DMR at that point too. Mm. And so going back is kind of like, oh, we we're going to conquer something. Like this pandemic, even though it hit us, we're coming back for vengeance. And we're going to be even, even better. So excited for that. What are your expectations? Like, do you have a mark, a time that you're, that you're aiming for as you push towards nationals? You can, both of you can answer this. <laughs> oh, man. I know we're kind of taking it one week at a time. I don't know that we've talked about it with our coaches, but I know ultimate goal is to win nationals, and, and you, anything can happen once you step up to the line at nationals. It's anyone's game, so it doesn't matter where you're going in ranked. I mean, breaking the record again would be really cool. So <laughs> sub 1049, so 1048 would be incredible. Okay. And I do think we have the ability to do that. I know some of us walked away from that race being like, maybe we had like, just like a little bit more that we could give. So, Fantastic stuff. Thanks for coming in. Congratulations on just a, a remarkable race. And let's give you some BYU Sports Nation karma to go run with at Nationals. Should we do that? Yes. Yeah. Let's go. I don't know if you know how it works, but typically you get it. <laughs> And you're already awesome, yeah. and it just takes you to a new level of awesome. Perfect. Awesome. That's what we need. You'll take right. it. Congrats to you and the rest of your team doing amazing things all over the country this past weekend. And good luck at Nationals. Thank, Thank you. Well done. All right, Thursday, Lauren Gustin and fourth place BYU women's basketball. Big game with second place Portland at 9 Eastern on BYU TV and the app. Up next, speaking of records, Greg, this week's edition of Top 5 Tuesday goes into the most unbreakable BYU records. This is BYU Sports Nation. This portion of BYU Sports Nation is presented by Maersk, your e-commerce logistics shipping partner. This portion of BYU Sports Nation is presented by Mountain America, the official credit union of BYU Athletics. BYU Sports Nation is on demand. Download the free BYU TV and BYU Radio apps or listen to the podcast, subscribe, rate, and review. Top five Tuesday takes us to a list of the top five most unbreakable records hmm. within BYU sports. This were, you, was, were you consulted on these? Uh, I was a little bit, and there's, okay. a, there's a lot of room for debate, but we had to do a show, so we just had to put the list together. Okay, here we go. At number five, <laughs> at the top of our list, we have the Jimmer. Back in 2010-11, that remarkable season, he averaged an incredible 29 points per game. Jimmer would lead the Cougars in scoring that year, leading them to the Sweet 16, while also securing NCAA Player of the Year honors. Who's gonna break that? that, that that's crazy. Number four takes us back to the 1970s. Tina Gunn of women's basketball set the career scoring mark that has now stood for 45 years. She scored 2,759 points in her career. In 7980, she led the nation with 967 points scored. You get to around 1,000, that's, uh, that's rarefied air. At number three, Shauna Robach's 35 goal season for <laughs> women's soccer back in 1996. She also holds the number two and three spots for goals scored in a season at BYU. She's number one all time scoring with 94 goals. <laughs> the gap to second place, which is Michaela Coulihan, Michaela Clough now. It's a 41-goal gap from first to second. Those were the days yeah. where they were flying to the back of the net. It's simple, Greg. You just got to score like a goal a game. It can't be that hard, right? <laughs> Goodness. Number two, we need to, or we had rather, to the diamond for number two, Gary Cooper. Great BYU baseball player, one of the back cats. 99 runs scored in a single season in 1985. Cooper is also at number six all-time in runs scored per game with 1.41. Two-time All-American now BYU win three WAC titles. And sitting at number one, we go to the gridiron. It is Ty Detmer with his career passing yard number of 15,031 yards. He also leads the program with most passing yards in a season at more than 5,000 and in a game at 603. In fact, I, I think, didn't, didn't John Walsh break the single game record? He think, did, and they, think, lost, and they lost. And they lost to Utah State. John Walsh broke that one, but those others all belong to Ty. Yeah. And maybe it shouldn't count for Walsh because they lost the game. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I kid, I kid. Our question of the day. I was on the sideline that day up oh, in Logan. Anthony goodness. Calvillo actually outdueled John Walsh in a wild one. Yes. 
What type of realistic success do you expect from BYU Athletics in year one of the Big 12? Our Elite Voice of the Day presented by PAX Healthcare Elevated comes from Jordan Royal on Twitter saying soccer and cross country sweep the conference. Okay. They're going to be right there. Today's Rise and Shoutout presented by Mountain America, the official credit union of BYU Athletics. We're giving it to softball for sweeping the West Coast Conference Awards and going 5-0 at the Littlewood Classic. Our thanks to today's guests, Bill Connolly, Elena Ellsworth, and Annalise Hart. Sorry to Wayne Gretzky. <laughs> we ran out of time. Uh, the conversation continues 24-7 on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. This and all of our shows on demand, BYUSN.com. For Greg, I'm Spencer. See you tonight for BYU Basketball with Mark Pope. Go Cougs.